Welcome back to Magnum P.I. and that guy. Today is a special <laughs> podcast because I have my good, dear friend, Brett Simmons, who was standing in for Ty Frank. Uh, Ty Frank is hanging out with hoity-toity snooty people. Um, so and cool. so I called uh, my, my buddy and, and movie lover, Brett Simmons, is going to come hang out with us. Hey, Brett. Hey, so stoked to be here, but I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm not an adequate villain for Ty, man. This is like really, this is B tier stuff now. Like, I'm sorry. Uh, it's listen, my fault. I could, <laughs> listen, we could, we could have a mannequin being on the other side and we're still good to go. Don't worry <laughs> about it. You know, all you have to do is have a grumpy face, like just sit there with a grumpy face okay. and, 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 and hate me and everything I say. And then that's like the perfect tie. Right. That's the perfect tie. Yeah. What movie are we talking about today? Oh, today we're talking about. I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. I mean, that's not a hint. That's that? the movie. <laughs> like, the, that's the poster <laughs> the for Goonies, the movie we're man. talking about. <laughs> yeah. Goonies. The Goonies. We have to um, make sure do you remember? this entire time we can't say, we can never say die. Never can't say die. Can, can you remember the first time you saw the Goonies? Oh, geez. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was on home video. It was like probably like 87, 88, like late 80s. I wish I saw it in the theater. That, what a wonderful time to be a kid. To be a kid oh. in the 80s because and I think like this is the first time I remember and Spielberg was was kind of took the lead on this where they were making movies for kids, but it was in between. It was like making movies yeah. for teenagers. And yeah. if you were younger than a teenager, it was so cool because it had edge to it, you know, and so it was the first kid movie where they talked like we talked when our parents weren't around and you're right, like, Oh right. my God, he said shit. Oh, you know, we say shit, you know? And it was yeah. dangerous. And, and you know, like do, Goonies in particular, like I re like the first, I remember watching ET and I remember the main kid on ET. What's his name? Uh, right. You know, this the yeah, main well, kid on ET. Okay. It plays Elliot. What's his name? Elliot. Uh, uh, Thomas. The, that's it. That's it. It's, it. it's, um, uh, Oh my gosh, I know, but now I'm blanking on it. This is really embarrassing. If only we Hold had on. a producer that was on the ball that could fucking Henry Thomas. Hell Henry yeah. Thomas. Oh, Henry Thomas. Henry Thomas. Dang. So Henry Thomas calls his brother penis breath. And I remember being like, <laughs> did he just say penis breath? And looking yeah. around like we're in theater and there's like a kid saying penis breath. And I was like, I am I knew I was so in, you know? And the Goonies yep. really leans into that. And what makes these movies special is it's, it's, it's different than Disney. It, it kind of separates that there is real danger. There's real horror. The kids are in real situation. And they come through because they're kids, because of the right. wonder, because of the imagination. And it shows their resilience. And the, the themes of that run through this movie. It makes it special when you are a kid watching it because... You're like, this is how we, this is how me and my friends talk. And it's like a secret thing. And it makes you feel right. like, oh, I, that, that, he's the, that guy of the group. And he's that, I'm mouth, I'm mouth of the group. And you can really connect to that. I know it's funny because they, they sounded like us. It's like you said, like, I really felt like it was way more movie about me and my actual buddies, you know, like uh, yeah. I could put myself in it so easily. And when I was a kid, I had, um, when my when I was young, I had uh, asthma really bad, and so when Mikey had an inhaler, I was like, "Oh, I felt so seen." <laughs> I was like, "Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah." And you know, and and that's the trick is like you know because when they introduce this, almost like a heist movie, everybody has their specific personality, everybody has their specific yeah. talent. And what a great introduction! You start off and you meet the Fratellis. And he's in prison and the way they escape and the mother's there. So you realize like these guys are real, like they kill people. This is a real, real bad people, you know, but then there's the fun of them racing on the beach and getting away. And through that sequence, you meet each character, you meet, you go through each guy and you meet their character and their talent. It has that like heist so feel good. like this is the gadget guy. This is that. So there's so much ground and so much covered in that, in that initial introduction when they go through yeah. with it. I'm actually a huge fan of like, it's, it's a personal thing of me where I really love movies that start big and fast. Like I love movies that just drop you in. And like Goonies is one of those, just like you said, meeting everybody through the chase and just 
the escape from the prison and all that. It's just like, it's, it's one of my favorite things. And people, you know what? I've, I've been thinking about this a lot too. Goonies reminds me that there's not enough conversation about Spielberg, the producer, because obviously he's like one of the greatest directors of all time. He's made awesome movies, but dude, the guy's like, the guy's made already made just movie history and his own personal career. And then out the gate, he's producing Gremlins, Gremlins, Goonies, Back to the Future, Young Sherlock Holmes. It's like, what is this guy? Is, this is insane. Like, what can't he do? You know? Yeah. I mean, if you go through the first, the, the those two decades, the 80s and the 90s, he, yeah. if he didn't direct it, he has his hand on all of your favorite movies, all of the movies yeah. that really mattered. You know, I, I, I ran into somebody this weekend and he came up and he was a fan of the podcast and he was talking and he said, uh, you know, you guys will talk about perfect movies. Like you talk about Die Hard and you like do a breakdown, and you go into it. And he says, what makes a movie perfect? What is that? Mm. You have all the, the, the mechanical things like a, a fantastic script, characterization, great acting, great directing, everything. But there is an element of magic that comes in and yeah. that's the intangible. And there's yeah. some directors like Spielberg that just has his, he just has his hand on the crystals, man. He can just harness yeah. magic and put those into movies. And it's, and it's, it's unique. It's something, and, and even if he's not directing it, if he's touching it, it turns into magic. And, yeah. uh, and this is a great example of that. I have a, uh, and, and you have kids and you educate your kids properly and you show them the great movies of, of the past. I have a new appreciation for movies because my kids have very short attention spans, even shorter than mine when I was a kid. And when, if I put on a movie and that movie grabs them and pulls them through the second act to the midpoint, because the second act is they'll, they'll tune out. If it's a lesser movie, right. they'll tune out. But if it holds them and it holds them all the way through to the point where they don't move and at the end of the, 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 the thing, they're like, just where, what, where was I? Where did, what happened? And Goonies is one of those movies. When yeah. I sat him down, like Goonies, Ghostbusters, uh, E.T., e you know, and I sit back and I watch them watch it, and you see, yeah. like, why this movie is so special and how profound it is. And, I, and obviously, I think it has a lot to do with, the, the, you know, being through a kid's point of view. Um, of course, yeah. But it grabs them and holds them and pulls them through. It's so true. I actually showed, because, you know, I did the same thing. I cycled through the movies with my kids. And when I got the Goonies, one thing that was funny was it does kind of a uh, – I, I hadn't realized how much it is a product of its time as far as its pacing, you know, because, like, you meet all the kids and everybody, but the first act is a little long, and it kind of takes a little while before, like, the treasure hunting stuff. And I reached a point because my son, not so much. He's way more like me, but my girls, it's kind of like you're saying where they – their attention span really tests some of my favorite movies. I'm like, stay here and watch this now. And um, <laughs> they, they were, uh, Goonies tested them a little bit because they were just kind of like, why is this all that? Why do they keep talking? And why is really? But you said they're going to be hunting for treasure. But yeah. so I had to keep them like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Sloth kind of freaked them out a little bit because he's supposed to at first. Once it finally kind of kicked into gear, they were just like, this is the greatest thing ever. But it did, That's it tested them a little bit, which was bizarre because I'm sitting here thinking like, there's no, this movie's so great, but I did, I did notice. I was like, it is paced a little bit more like the movies we grew up on, but aren't paced this way so much now. Like they're used to like DreamWorks movies and, you know, the movies an hour and a half, they're just zipping through. Yeah, it's interesting to me because the chemistry um, with the kids is what really pulled me in through that first yeah, act and getting to know sure. them and their relationship together. It was at around the time, like with Stand By Me, uh, I remember like the Losers Club, I was reading Stephen King at the time, and those, you know, outsider kid, you know, friendship groups where they felt like they're outsiders, but they were family and they were connected to each other because the secret is... Everybody feels like an outsider, even if you're the yeah. football star in high school. Everybody. So when they see that, they see them. Right. If you're being honest, they see themselves in it. But one of the things uh, that I thought it did well, just like Stand By Me did well, there are movies where it's like, okay, this guy's the, the brain. This is the jock. This is the, you know, and they kind of have those uh, right. caricatures. 
and that's fine. You know, that like Mean Girls does that and it's like they play on it and it's good and those movies can do it. But the reality is, is like if they hold on to those characters, then it becomes hollow. It's not as interesting. I would even say Karate Kid suffers like in retrospect. And it's obviously gotten more sophisticated with the new uh, Cobra Kai TV shows. But William Zapta is like the bully tough kid. and It's just mugging yeah. the whole time. And you have z- it's a cardboard cutout. You know, it's like there's no there's zero connection to that. But you're so invested and connected to Daniel LaRusso and rooting for him pulls you through the movie. So with right. these kids, they do get introduced, you know, that Data is the guy with the gadgets and the gadgets don't work and this is the comedy. But he has this vulnerability and this big heart and they truly right. care about each other and love each other. Uh, even Mouth, really funny, genuinely. But they, they're all there because they love Mikey and they don't want Mikey to lose his house. Um, right. And you right. feel the friendships and you feel how much they care about each other. And so they kind of, they're more sophisticated than the original titles that they get when they introduce themselves. Yes. Yeah, so like you, kind get of the, that. you get the archetype when, that you can latch on to when they first show up, but it does get much deeper than that. Like the most, the most surprising one, I remember even when the, the first time I watched it was how, it's funny you mentioned Karate Kid, because Josh Brolin playing Brand, like his character feels like the quintessential 80s bully older brother right like that was a thing and so you're just okay so he's just here to be the jerk and he's here to get in the way and make things complicated but as the movie goes on he's kind of sucked into it all and by the end of the movie he's a goonie and it's so (laughs) kind of counter to what the movies of the day were doing because you're kind of used to going all right this is the guy that's just going to bother me the whole time and get in the way but not be a main character on the poster yeah. he's the one at the top of the rope holding on you know it's like he's pulling you in it yeah and, and like the sweet brother dynamic you know between him and mikey and looking yeah. out for mikey on that level it all just yeah. kind of subverted my eight my 80s expectations at the time and i really i really appreciate that the movie yeah did that with the character it really surprised me goonies had edge you know in the 80s yeah. that, that you, you wouldn't have today because the whole like truffle shuffle i mean that was that's that's fat shaming. I mean, it's a cruel thing yes. that they were doing yes. to Chunk. But for it didn't seem, for whatever reason, and maybe, you know, I mean, maybe Chunk feels differently. It didn't seem mean because well, they were very careful to show how much they they loved each other. Yes. Right? Exactly. And so exactly. If it, yeah. And so, you know, there there are things like that in movies where it just feels mean and it hits a false note. And then there's things yep. where they can get away with it because they truly care about each other and they truly love each other. And at the end, you know, they're they're all helping each other and saving each other. So yeah. it just, it, it, I mean, everybody talks about the truffle truffle and how hilarious it is. But you watch it now as an adult and you're like, is that, is that right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That was actually one of my reactions when I was showing it to the kids. Because, you know, in my mind, the movie's perfect. And I'm showing it to the kids. I'm, I don't know. I don't know. That, that's not nice. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe don't say that. You know, like some of the stuff don't Mouse says, you know? Yeah, He's like yeah. talking to the maid about like the drugs and stuff. Yeah, it's like, hey, look, look. That's a perfect <laughs> example. Like as a kid watching Mouth, that's the hardest I laughed in the movie. When he's it's doing brilliant. this because it was so like as a kid you love dangerous stuff like that. You love like right. to you know, he's talking about, you know, torturing in the closet and you know, running yeah. drugs and all these things, and you're like, Look what he's doing, he's doing it to an adult and he's not even scared and like you know, and it's like I it's know. so cool to see that. Well, you said it. You said it so well. Like they they were saying the things to each other and doing they were doing the things that we actually did, right? Because they were depicted accurately to what our lives in the 80s looked like with our friends. And movies hadn't yet kind of started to do that so well. I mean, even with Mm -hmm. Chunk, in real life, when a group of people really loves each other, one of the languages of love is harsh criticism and teasing each other. But it's because, you know, you're in a safe space with safe people and that love is rooted underneath it all, right? But that's really how a lot of, like, especially, like, boys, part of their intimacy is making fun of each other, right? But I hadn't yeah. really in my own in my own life at that point seen that expressed accurately in something, you know? Because mm-hmm. when you think about writers yeah. sitting down to write stuff and too busy trying to calculate what each moment and what, what each interaction is contributing towards the story and the audience's opinion of a character and 
that's kind of one of those things that I don't think on the page probably felt like it could work as well as it works in this movie. And the other thing that really blows my mind is that it always trips me out that Richard Donner's name doesn't get held among like famous conversations about great directors as much as I feel like it really should. Cause man, the guy made some of the greatest movies of all time, but he was also one of the, the greatest of his craft, you know, and there's so much careful direction that's going on with the kids and how they're handling the dialogue, but also blocking them. And also, by the way, directing like five, six <laughs> kids under the age of what, under the age of 15, it's like a nightmare, but it all feels so genuine and authentic. I did read that uh, Spielberg, uh, uncredited secretly directed two of the scenes in Goonies. And when I had heard that, I was like, I need to know what scenes he directed. Cause you know, it's like, there's always, there's all the, you know which ones, the, right? All the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I looked yeah. it up. I don't know. Obviously I, I don't know for sure, but apparently the wishing well scene he directed and the, uh, and, and the then, pipe scene and the pipe scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, cool. Not the scenes I expected. I can actually kind of get it with the wishing well a little bit, but the wishing well definitely is very Spielbergian. But the pipe scene has like one of the funny, the, one of the best sound cues of of the whole movie is when uh, Sloth like throws the pipes up and you're Arr! in a car wreck yeah. and then ah! and then woo woo woo, woo, woo. And he goes uh oh <laughs> and that's um, like the guy sitting on the toilet getting shot into the ceiling. Oh yeah, then you get shot to the ceiling. Um, but we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So yeah, yep, yep. So now we know everybody in the Goonies. We care about everybody in the Goonies, and it it's really emotional when you find what they're up against. That they're gonna they they're, yeah. they're gonna you know destroy their house. They're gonna put in a country club. This is their home. This is where they were, and their parents don't have the money to deal with this. So they're gonna move. They're gonna lose their friends. They're gonna see the sun come up in another town. That's what they're saying here. And you connect to that emotionally. So now you're emotionally connected with the quest. Then we go up to the attic and we find about uh, Chester Copperpot and one and yep. One-Eyed Willie. And I love me a good like I love me a good history like you know when the when the music's like do do you know, it goes into that. I was just gonna that say score. when you were saying that I could hear the score in my head. It's so your iconic. Music, when your musical up there. do do the, get the give us the it's idea like, of the score. Bloom, 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 bloom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's so good, though. You're just like, oh, yeah. what? That, as you were saying, you said one eyed Willie, and in my head, it's a bling, 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 bling. It, it's crazy. Chester Copperpot, right? Is it Chester Copperpot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got it. What a crazy name, Copperpot. It's, I know. So, Ty and I, you know, and you're probably on, in Ty's camp, most filmmakers are, but we always have a debate over film scrawl, you know, like in the beginning mm. of Terminator, when it's like in the year of da 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 da, whatever. Now, for yeah. me, if it's done right, a lot of times it puts me like it puts me. It's like once upon a time in a fantasy story, right? Like I'm like, oh, I'm in, you know, like the beginning of Terminator. I'm like, oh, I'm, and you get a little brief history, and it puts me in the story. He hates text crawl, but if it's done right, I like. I mean, think about Star Wars, right? But I also love me a good blue, 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 blue. and you're like Chester yes. Copperpot. He was an adventurer, and he the went legend. And I'm like, oh, the legend of Chester Copperpot. Which is which is interesting about this is uh, Sean Astin. The script was not fully done when they were doing this. They were. It was one of those things which I've worked on before, where you're getting pages as you're going. So originally, the Fratelli brothers were telling the story of Chester Copperpot, and so oh, yes, I've read this. Yeah, right. And so Dick Donner was like, "No, I think it should come from the kids." So he said, "Okay, Sean, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna tell you the story." And then you're going to go and tell the story just from your head. And we're going to yes. record it and do everything like that. And he said, I was so nervous because I, you know, and you go back and look and there's a, a spontaneity. There's an, an energy. There's an excitement in that story. You pull people in. It's that once upon a time moment. And we like, you know, me as an actor, I would have spent, you know, days like really just going over and right. like really, you know, and, and, and understanding and what this is and what it emotionally means to me and in this moment how we're doing this and then sometimes you're like you just gotta let it go man you just gotta let it ride you know and you can have moments yeah. like this and there's there's great moments in cinema history where they're like i mean he didn't he had no i fucking he had no idea who chester copper pot was or the whole story of the thing they told him on the day you know and they're like i know it's i amazing, think we're gonna though. 
Yeah, isn't that crazy? It's on also brilliant direction on his part too, because rather than giving him pages, he's this little kid and go, hey, last minute thing, go memorize these. Every single human in history has told a story and listened to a story, right? Like when you're a kid, this is like the pinnacle of when story time is a thing, right? Like your friends yeah. telling ghost stories at night when you're doing sleepovers and stuff, you know, and the idea of telling him a story and saying, great, now go tell your version to the guys and just filming yeah. it. It's so smart and so good. Yeah. And that scene works because his energy and the authenticity of it is really what draws you in. You don't sit there and feel like, oh, okay, here we go. The exposition fairy just dropped in so I can yeah. learn about what's going to happen in the rest of this movie. Right. It feels so genuine. And of course, the music makes it feel pretty magical. And you're just kind of like, oh, man, I want to know. What is, go what is this? Yeah. And it's also brilliant that they switched it to the kids because it's really at we, – we know the Fratellis are going to be connected to going after this treasure – but the heart of the movie is on the shoulders of these kids. And now the heart of the mission is on these kids too. Like the whole back, we now own the backstory with them, you know, as opposed to with the bad guys. That's so smart. It's just great storytelling. And they have, they have the tools for the journey. Yeah. Right. They have the map and they have, and, and it's the cool, like it's like this aged pirate map. So, you know, where you are now, you care about the kids the ticking clock has started. You know that they're about to lose their home. You care about what's happening to them, but now they have a, a, a way out. And this way out is like out there. You know, it, it, it is what you get. You're going to go find, you know, pirate treasure and, and all of this. And, and, but they bind together. They now have hope and they're going to do this and they get together and they tie up Josh Brolin, you know, and they, That's and great. they get on the bikes and they go and it's this great, you know, chase sequence. This movie's full up of with like that weird spring. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, Brolin is working out the whole first act. He's like doing like solar flexes and doing, you know, like all these things. And it's like definitely 80s. Like he has the headband. He's got the cut yep. off sweatshirt with the cut off sleeves. He's doing gravity boots. It's like all it's like a uh, an 80s exercise infomercial that came on all the yeah. time. He was doing them all. So good. And, I was just laughing they, at some of the gear we had. Like, people, like, worked out with that thing? Like, did that work? I love the details. Like, to f the fact that they flatten his tires, right? So he could have got on a bike and chased them, whatever. But they flatten his tires. Now he has to get on his little girl's bike. The, the like, yeah. little sister's bike. And he's it's awesome. riding that. And then, at the lowest moment where he's riding this little bike with a basket, the bully and the girl of his dreams and the girl, pull up. Yep. Yeah, and he's on, and you're fucking you're humiliated for him. Everybody relates to that nightmare of a moment, right? Yeah. Like it just, but that's what's so incredible. The movie taps into everything you felt in that period of time of your yeah. life. You know, it's like between high school and childhood. I mean, yeah. I wish I could have gone into some cave under my house with my buddies and looked for a treasure. And like the Goonies let me, you know, but. Well, we used to do that. I mean, we used to, so. How you know this movie struck an honest note and really inspired wonder and imagination with kids and really knew how to do that is we would play Goonies. Like we would, we saw that movie, we would get together, we're playing Goonies, you're this, that, and we would go out on these adventures way deep in the woods. We'd go explore old abandoned houses and we would pretend that all this stuff was going on. That's why that movie was such a massive hit. Um, and still to this day, I mean, it's got, you know, I told you about my kids, your kids, like you can watch that movie and you get, you get swept up in it. And now I will say like, in terms of the William Zapta and Karate Kid, like the, the, the bully in this movie is mm -hmm. uh, pretty, you know, I mean, he's it's, not too, I'm not too worried about him. <laughs> there's not a lot of Stan Laskowski going on. Like there's, you know, there's not a lot of backstory. No. There's not a lot of, it's like, okay, you have this look on your face and you hate everyone. Go. You know? <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and he's kind of like smarmy like he's not even particularly like like buff or skilled he's just he's a douche before i knew what a douche was <laughs> and he just happens to be the guy that's going trying to tear down their house's son <laughs> like it just yeah it's a bit on the nose it's, you know it's like it's the actually guy really yeah <laughs> It, yeah, it's really funny it's, watching like the '80s movies, like going back and seeing all the convenient connections throughout all the movies yeah. we grew up on, and that's for sure one of them. Like, oh, he's a, he's also the son of the. Okay, got it. That yeah, that, that works. And the chemistry of these kids and the and the things that does well, it's so well that you kind of just forgive those moments and yeah, those things for sure. There's certain role like Carrie Green in this. This was her first movie, and I think like I remember her mostly from Lucas. 
she, you know, I think that was like her. Um, she quit acting, by the way. But Carrie Green, what's her name in um, Karate Kid? Uh, Elizabeth Shue. Oh, Elizabeth Shue. Yeah, yeah. It's like if you took, if you cut out all kids' fantasies of like the, the girl in high school, you know, it was like, you know, they had, a, they had a knack for finding that, right? Yeah. And Martha, Martha Plimpton is like, you know, she's fantastic. And I, yeah, and she's awesome. I, I, yeah, she's a fantastic. And I love her and everything. She's got this great sense of humor. And she was kind of playing the nerdy best friend, but she has right. such a, she has such a, gr- a bit of grace to her. She has such a fierce intelligence and a sense of humor uh, and like dignity about her that she like right. de- definitely transcended what that caricature was of her. And then she was another character too, where it's like all of that was, I didn't expect them to be a part of the journey on the level that they end up being a part of in the end. You know, I didn't expect them to have a connection all the way to the end of the movie and a character arc and a change and to warm up to them, you know, cause when you kind of meet her, she's kind of a part of the group that you're like, nah, these are the jerks. We don't really like them, but then they, they really twist it and change it and make you start caring about her. And, and, and yeah. that group, well, you know, Carrie Green and Brolin and Plimpton, you're like, I thought I wasn't supposed to like these characters and now they're a part of it all. And I do, I care about yeah. them. And for me, it's yeah. like, I'm under 10 years old. That's a big deal at the time. <laughs> right. I was like, right. none of them shoot stuff out of their belt. They don't got oil yeah. that shoots out of their shoes. They do. <laughs> <laughs> then they have that, that weird treasure thing where they just like hold it up to the rocks and they're like, Oh, it's the three rocks. And like, this is where, this is the direction we're going to go. And it, and it takes them to that restaurant where it just so happens the Fatellis are, are holding up. What is the actress's name from throw mama from the train? Uh, oh, it's um, Ann Rams and yeah, it's Ramsey, Ann Ramsey, Ann Ramsey, Ann Ramsey, Ann Ramsey. Yeah, I loved her. She was a fantastic '80s character. Yes, and yes, I think yes. she got. I think she either won or got nominated for an Oscar for Throw Mama from the Train. She was really good in that. Oh um, yeah, you're right. She no, she a, did. I think she got nominated. But yeah, she's phenomenal in that. She's great in this too. She terrified me. Yeah. <laughs> drink it she gets the water yeah. and throws it on the table and it's like rather like ah and they're so scared and the fertilities are genuinely terrifying like there's yeah. they're killers like they're there's the, you know and so you have real fear in that but what really gets you spooked is the monster in the basement you know you hear those groans coming from the basement and you see that and so that is scary. such a nice i mean that that is a a, a fantastic addition to this whole thing it raises the stakes it there's a little bit of horror in that you know when yes. with the way the when it approaches the camera and he's like, and like the, the, yeah in the, the chain you're like oh my god what it's the hell scary. is this thing yeah it's, it's so super scary. scary and you care about chunk and chunk freaking out you're kind of freaking out with them you're like feeling permission to be afraid but it, it's so true like it's so scary and it's introduced brilliantly because if they had just introduced sloth without any of like the pre-introduction where you're kind of hearing them you know yeah it would have been so jarring but the kind of sent up the kind of send up this haunting kind of allusion to something scary around the corner and in the basement yeah really it sets it up so well and you totally buy it like it's the type of thing that i could see a movie today doing and completely doing horribly <laughs> but they oh, did yeah. it perfectly you know you you talk about dick donner you talk about steven spielberg you talk about chris christopher columbus this movie so easily could have been bad. This movie so easily could have not worked. Sloth, you, you would have to get that perfect to work. Number one, to be genuinely scary. Number two, to genuinely believe the building of the friendship between the two. And number three, be genuinely funny. And, and yeah. hitting all of those notes with this crazy character. And throughout the whole thing, tonally, because even the Fratelli brothers... They border on slapstick, not border on slapstick. There's slapstick moments when he falls, when they do the grease shoes and he slips on the log and he falls and, and racks himself and he, you know, yeah. Joey Pants falls over on the thing. And so there's slapstick there, but it doesn't undermine their danger. It doesn't yes. undermine how scary they are. When you think Chunk escapes at the end of the basement and he stops that car and he's like, oh, thank God, the freezer, and there's guys in there and da da da. And it's, it's the Fratelli brother, and he's like, oh, I'm a dad, oh, oh, man. and starts singing, and you're like, fuck me. And they're, and they're gonna put his, they're gonna put his hand in the blender, and there's yes. like real torture that's about to happen, and there's a dead I mean, body 
in the freezer. You know, but the, the, the dead body in the freezer and the whole basement thing, and, they, and then they cross the threshold. And the bats thing, you, you know, you would see the bats, and the bats is kind of a throwback to those old scary movies, you know, where they go in there and, and they have the bats. It works for this because it's almost like they're leaving the real world and now they're going in the full magical world. And it is the right. threshold that they are upon. And so yep. the bats signify there's some danger that's gonna that you're gonna get down there. There's some danger. Yes. And we talk about Spielbergian, like all the gadgets and the things like on Back to the Future and the thing they have there. The booby traps and the tunnels, I mean, it is very Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, I mean, I think there's even everything a I wanted as a child. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, is there a bo- yes i think i remember a boulder either falling down on them or like rolling towards them yeah there's um, there there's a boulder rolling towards them at some point i do remember that i just remember it felt like indiana jones for kids it's exhilarating it's fun and it's crazy to think how can you're talking about like kind of modern kind of the modern nostalgia kick that's been going on right now spielberg and lucas were two artists that were constantly trying to pay homage to the stuff they grew up in, like the 50s serials, but doing their own modern thing with it, right? Right. And so, like, Star Wars Indiana Jones really tapped into it, but also took it to a whole other level and really did its own thing while paying respect. But this, on almost an even more original level, was kind of like, it's almost like this movie's acting out what those kids do when they leave the theater from seeing Indiana Jones. Which is right. absolutely what I did. <laughs> like, yeah. me and my buddies wanting to run and jump down hills and pretending like there's snakes. And if we step on this yeah. rock, spears are going to shoot at us. And yeah. so when Goonies happens and they're finally, like you said, they're crossing the threshold into the caves and crossing all the booby traps and everything, I was just like, this may be the greatest <laughs> thing I have ever seen in my life. You were like, I am on board. I, so I don't remember if I saw this in the theater. I, I like to think I did. I hope I did. Um, I don't remember the first time I saw it. I just remember it being omnipresent in my childhood. And yeah, I remember yeah. uh, living out in Winder, Georgia, and like, I had to walk. Literally, the, the, the cliche story, I would walk a mile on dirt roads to get to the bus stop to go to school. There, there was a family like on my journey to the thing. They were called the Bears, and the Bears had a VHS player, and they had all like a, a cool selection of VHS movies. And I would hang out with their kids, and one of the movies they had were Goonies, and we would watch Goonies all. The, it never got old. That movie had just it was just a, a gold mine of of magic. And you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about in the beginning, and they had these fun you know, these fun booby traps and then they come across Chester Copperpot, which I love a good, like looking at the wallet, this is checker. We found the body. He never made it. He was killed in these booby traps. And then they end up in the, uh, the, the wishing well with all the treasures. And what's really smart about the script and what's really smart about this movie is they kind of get what they want early, but it's a pale comparison to the real thing. They have a really strong out because at this point, when the Fratellis kick in, this is the first time they make a choice. Because at this point, yeah. they're just you know they're staying alive. They're 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 going this thing or whatever, and you know the the bullies conveniently are are hanging out at a wishing well. I don't know how many of your friends <laughs> yeah. like hang out at a wishing well, but anyway, they're hanging out I, at a wishing well. I used well, to talk to people in the wishing they're at the bottom all of the well. <laughs> Yeah, that was our spot. You know, a lot of people hung yeah. out at Dairy Queen. We hung out at the wishing well. Um, <laughs> And so they're hanging out at the wishing well. Uh, Mikey gives that great speech. And this is our time here and now. And then, you know, Mouth is like, yeah, well, this is mine. And I'm taking it with me. I'm taking it all with me. Right. So there's that moral debate of like, we can't take other people's wishes. um, But they found treasure and they can take that treasure with them and they can get out of the danger. They have this thing getting out of danger. So what are they going to choose to do? You know, and courage is, is one of those strong themes. And, and the fact that children can achieve great things with courage is another really strong running theme. And then, you know, the greatest line in the movie is when Mikey gives that inspiring speech about, you know, going forward and finding the real treasure. And with the clincher, we made it further than the adult. We made it further than Chester Copperpot. You know, together right. as a team, we can do this thing. And they, they renew right. their energy and they renew the hope. And then she sends her jacket up, and he goes, "You Cody!" 
<laughs> you remember that scene? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny because like I never I, it took me so long to even understand what a goonie was. So I just kind of accepted that they were calling them set, like goonies never die, but they're not sitting around like the whole first half of the movie going, "We're the goonies, hey the goonies, what's up the goonies?" Or the goonies like I yeah. I didn't get it. And when he yelled the insult, "You goonie!" I was like, "Wow, man, I don't I don't this guy is you get it get now, though, out right? of here. Yeah, I get it now, of course. Yeah, okay, because they live on the goon docks. But... What was Carrie Green's character's name? I, I, I can't remember. It was, uh, what? Andy. Andy. So, Andy, that's right. So we would, Dan Nowak, who was a writer, producer on our show, and Ty, we'll be on set. And just, like, I'll be in the middle of a scene, and, like, they would be off, and they just they would just scream out, Andy, you Goody! Like just oh my gosh. Like, we just say, like it just we would it just crack me up just randomly that hear those so things. Funny. Cuz it is it is like one of the missed lines and it you know it's it's uh it's it's great and it's funny it's a treasure now but like that yeah. moment and that guy you know you forgive it because what they do they go forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to feel like yeah. on the day was he like Hi, uh, Mr. Spielberg um can I say something else? Does it? I'm, I'm just you know, wondering. I'm, like Spielberg, can you try I'm some alternate something takes? here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, Dick, can I have a word with you? Yeah, I know I'm. I know I'm an 18 punk kid, but I, I have a moment here. I'm feeling something. I feel like I really want to drive the, something home. I feel lost. I feel. I feel like I need her. I'm in love with her. I'm hungry for it. I need it all to come to the surface. And this, yeah. anyway, and he goes, sorry. I don't care. Yeah, just do say it, the line. kid. Yeah, just say the line. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they, you know, th- so now they go forward. The Fatelli brothers catch up. They do the slick shoes. We already talked about all that moment or whatever. Yeah, um, love it. And but and then I think it's it's an incredible dramatic situation with the old organ that's made out of bones, and they yeah. got a probably thing. And then it's a great callback to Mouth and his talent, where he can speak Spanish, but he's not that great at it. So there's a lot of tension underneath you know ye beware and so if they hit a false note and like the floor is falling down and it's a it, you know it's a for it's a kid my watching movie it, trap oh i love it oh and they they conquer it and their reward their reward is this amazing set and it's all practical by the way the, yeah. this the whole pirate ship and everything um but before they get to that set they get to do that crazy water slide Oh yeah, and the water slide I was so jealous of. I was so literally this movie took everything that I wanted as a kid and threw it into a movie. Like yeah. even the water slide. And I wasn't now adult Brett's going like, mm, it's probably a lot of bacteria. I don't know what that's too <laughs> you guys should keep your mouths closed, don't yell so much. But as a kid, you know, you're just like, Whoa But you and, know, and the water slide the water, had those high dive shootouts. Like they would shoot them out of a tunnel and they like split up. Yes. I was I was in, on board for I mean, that. they had to they had to have lost their minds filming that. But the other thing was going back to the organ. One of the things that was so brilliant about the span, you know, like the fact that mouth speaks Spanish and he's kind of like the linchpin to solving this thing. It's such a brilliant example. Not enough movies do it of hiding. You know, obviously you want to plant stuff in the beginning that you pay off later. Like people know that, but the audience knows that too. We're all kind of savvy, right? But it's such a brilliant one because the best way to hide a good plant is through a joke. And the whole time, him speaking Spanish to the maid in the beginning is just one ongoing joke that's supposed to be so funny. You're not reading into it as something you need to remember for later. Yeah. So when it comes back, it, it, it did its it did the perfect job of seeding an idea into your brain that you didn't you weren't waiting for it to come back. Where I feel like yeah. movies today don't lesser writers don't know how to do that quite as well. And now we feel those things, right? Like what what a random thing that he's speaking Spanish. That, that's obviously going to get called back. But it's completely right. hidden in humor. It's perfect. And this whole yeah. movie, like the whole, from this point onward, the movie is now paying off every single thing that we've been introduced to in the first half of it, which just makes it so, so satisfying. And you know the story about going to the next set with the pirate ship of what Richard Donner did to the kids, right? Well, it's another example a brilliant director making a brilliant directing choice because he knew just like he knew Sean Astin would tell the story to his own peers in his own voice better than he would say it scripted. He knew that the reaction of these kids to a real life scaled built 
in-person pirate ship would be better than anything he could tell them to do. And so he wouldn't allow any of the kids to see the entire pirate ship set until the cameras were rolling. And so when they all come out and they see it, their first time seeing it in the film is their first time seeing it in person, in real life. And their reactions are authentic. And it's, it's brilliant because that's, that's the type of thing that a director would, would know to trust their own nature, right? Just like, I, why would I make you act this when you are going to be blown away, you're going to be mystified, and you're going to have the exact reaction as a human being that I want you to have as a character? And so to hide it and have build the anticipation and then capture it, it's just brilliant. The reaction of wonder. And that is what the yeah. movie's about, you know, and re- seeing the real wonder on their faces. And uh, so, you know, when they get to that, when they get to the ship in the water, I don't know if you, you probably know this, you probably read it a hundred times, but there was an octopus scene in there. Yeah. That Have you seen out. it? I've seen, like, I've seen clips. Like, I've, I didn't seen like the full it scene cut together. DVD. Yeah, they had it on the DVD. It? It's not good. It's like, it's like Robin Williams' Popeye movie. Yeah, well, what's crazy is is there was a scene with gorillas stealing a car in this, and there was like a few. There was a scene where they're in the gas station, and the bully took the map and he sets it on fire and smokes it like a cigar. All those are hor. It's like you have gold, and then there's a bit of poo on the gold, and they they just yeah. go through and take out all the poo. You know, and it's the movie like- looks good, but somebody <laughs> farted. <laughs> but like, yeah. An octopus, and you know, and, it, and it's like the tentacles like would fall on you know on them and like it's pull them bad. under or whatever. Anyway, good thing they yeah. cut that. It was it was smart, and that's what's crazy too is like I think a lot about how it's Spielberg's great gift. I actually think it's Donner's great gift to knowing what to cut. You know, I mean Spielberg's the one writing the checks for this thing too, and it's like yeah. they were talking all about how that octopus. I remember the commentary Donner was talking about that how like the octopus was a whole thing. Because it all right. had to be incorporated into the set, and the set had to be built in order to accommodate puppeteers, and it was a whole thing. And to just go like, it's no good, and to just throw yeah. it out is pretty pretty big. And then we get the reward, man. They go on the ship, and there's treasures everywhere. I mean, and the the big shiny, pretty treasures. As a kid, you're like, you know, as a kid you probably connect better to shiny stones and beautiful diamonds and emeralds. Whereas like, if it's just stacks of cash, you'd be like, Oh, cool cash, you know, yeah. but like yeah. rubies and sapphires and all, it was very movie esque and magical. It's, even the, the, the treasure. It's really you know? true. It's so like, if it was like millions of dollars, it probably would be like four, not very impressive stacks of bills. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah, going in there, it's like, it, re- it always reminded me of Pirates of the Caribbean, like the skeleton sitting on the pile of gold, you know, where I'm like, I get this. And I love this, the imagery of the of the skeleton, too, like the pirate skeleton. Where I was like, man, this is so cool, but it's still a little haunting. And it still has a creep factor, but it's also like, oh, my gosh, all the gold. And, just love it. And, and, and Willie had one eye. But, you know, one thing that I don't understand is so you sell your ship into a cave and you're like, all right, guys, we're screwed. And you just sit there till you die and decompose. You yeah. don't try to climb out of the cave or like go. And not only that, you, just, that. You, you, you know, it's like, let's just sit here and die and decompose in our thing. And, you know, and it, and it has that subtle, that, that subtle, you know, greed is what is destroying their home. It's destroying their friendship dynamic. It's greed. So when they get a little greedy and they go for Willie's gold, he's like, leave that for Willie. You know, so yeah. the kids aren't so getting good. too greedy, right? And then you get, uh, you know, the Fratellis come and they're all greed. They're all, and then they're the ones right. that, you know, they're coming to steal the jewels and steal the wealth. And then they are too greedy and they take from Willie and Willie has the last laugh in that scenario. It's brilliant. And it's connected it's to the themes. I was know? just going to say, I've been going back, I've been going back to the movies of our youth trying to connect to them thematically. And I never thought until you just said it, how, yeah, the theme of greed runs so deep in this movie and the Fratellis are essentially the embodiment of the thematic threat of the house being taken away and greed taking their lives away. And then you have the Fratellis that are more like the physical thematic obstacle of all that. And I, I did not connect that till just now, Wes. That is... It well, was interesting too is they, they take just enough you know, they don't yeah. eat to, to get them out of their thing. They're taking this enough. 
But then you have that great third act twist when Sloth and Chunk shows up. <laughs> you know, and he's Captain Chunk, and uh, and and he and Sloth is a superhero, and they come and they have that that moment. Now this pirate fight at the end, this almost loses me. It almost becomes a bit, you know, it, it, you almost it, the danger comes out of it a little bit, you yes, know, because they're doing yes. the thing and they make them walk the plank, and it becomes kind of kind of silly or whatever. But I, I mean, as a kid, I fully enjoyed it. I still enjoy it. I don't, I don't want to say it took me out of it, but it almost did. It, it almost teeters did. on the edge. At every time a it, movie deals with adults fighting kids, it really runs that risk, right? right. <laughs> it's like, ooh, like this isn't an even match. Yeah. But it, yeah. It, yeah. It, it gets close, but the threat isn't the same. Like these, it doesn't, that's what I really feel like is, when they show up on the pirate ship at the end of the fight, it doesn't feel like the same guys that wanted to put Chunk's hand in a blender, which felt <laughs> right. terrifying. <laughs> right. Know? These guys, they just now they're kind of props for the kids to do their thing. It's um, a little cartoony, but it's great. Yeah, like, exactly. It's it. a little bit cartoony. You know, Chunk is sliding down the thing with his knife, which I thought was cool. And the swinging and all that was cool. Also, the ultimate fight at the end, that's where it kind of puts it in the category, the pirate movie category, which is going to be our top five when we get to it, um, because then it becomes a pirate movie at that point. Well, I guess it's always a pirate movie, because they're going to look for pirate treasure and, and everything like that. Yeah, but so it they hasn't go quite to, had the they go swashbuckling to, oh, sorry, until now. It hasn't been like a swashbuckler yeah, the swashbuckling. Now, so there is that moment. Now, how do you feel about when they're getting out of the cave and Sloth, you know, I, I definitely feel, you know, the development of the relationship between Sloth and Chunk, I'm moved by it. They have a friendship, two outsider people that had physical, you know, issues that are now connected to each other, friends together. And then he's escaping through the, ca- the cave at the end and Sloth and them have that like a moment where Chunk is crying and, uh, you know, it, 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 did it seem a little weird to you? Like it seemed a little, did, how did it strike I, you? Well, what was funny to me I'm trying to remember how I felt like in the context of when I first saw the movie. Now, when I was a kid, it didn't bother me. Yeah. When I was a kid, I I really cried a lot, but watching it older with my kids, I was kind of thinking like, there's no reality where sloth is going to be able to come integrate into society with chunk and these kids. Like this is (laughs) so bad, but I was like, well, yeah, this is where he's, yeah, this is probably where he, he should stay. By the way, we haven't talked about how great, Chunk was. Chunk was he, he, so dang good. And you know, he's, he's a, he was a, hilarious. an entertainment attorney. He became an entertainment lawyer. Yeah. He, like a prominent he, one. Like a big yes. deal one. It's crazy to me that he's one of the actors in the movie that I don't understand why he didn't get to do like more. Like at least a couple more movies. You know, like he, at least be an actor of the moment. Because he's such a standout character in the movie. And he does such a great job. He's so good. His level of comedy and timing is is really yes. good, and he, he you're right, he is a standout. I mean, I think everybody's favorite moment is when they're like, you know, basically confess, and he just starts confessing <laughs> yeah. all, all the shit he did too as, like, as a kid. Yeah. Girl. <laughs> I pushed my so sister down the stairs and I blamed it on the dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he talks about throwing up in the theater, and he's like. Ugh! You know, and yeah. his mom and he's crying the whole time. <laughs> Whatever, really um, good. It was great timing. I saw a clip with him on this like British TV show, and he was promoting the Goonies. The guy that he was on the show with is like famous for being almost mean. He had that British sarcasm, and he was kind of like he he kind of you know insults people. Um, there's a famous interview with Michael J. Fox was interviewing him, and he was like, you know, the the car is really the star of Back to the Future. And, you know, Michael J. Fox is like, okay, but don't tell me that, you know, so he he says mean things. Well, he was like talking about Chunk's weight in a way that he could never do today. And, uh, and he was like, you know, he goes, you know, what do you like to eat? And Chunk was like, food. (laughs) And he says, (laughs) and he was like, you know, talking about it. And he says, you know, do you, uh, sarcastically, I can't can't remember what, like, you know, do you exercise or what sarcastic is? Yeah, I do jazz and, and, you know, I, I, uh, jazz or say like, he was like basically saying, yeah, yeah, I'm a big, you know, workout guy. Like he was out. Uh, uh, sarcasm him, him, the other guy. And I was like, for a kid, like how smart he was, his comic timing, and how well he was at that interview. I'm like, dude, this guy, he could have been, he could have had like, you know, done some other things because he had real talent. 
Yeah, I'm really curious to know what the what the story is um, because I yeah. totally agree. I'm like, man, he had everything. He really had everything to have kept going real strong. It's shocking to me that he didn't. Now, and now we're getting to the point where I'll give the movie another pass. Uh, okay, so cops show up. They're looking for the kids. Okay, maybe you know, maybe they figured out the map or they knew they were heading that direction. Okay, okay, parents show yeah. up. Okay, maybe the cops, you know, maybe they were heading the same direction. They had thing. Okay, I get that. But the greedy man and and his and the bully son, they show up yep. on this beach in Oregon, and you know. And uh, by the way, a lot of their real parents are the people that come out. Yes, to, like they yes. they let a lot of their real parents come out and uh, be a part of the movie. And that was that was another great moment of characterization where you see an extension of themselves through their parents. Yes, um, totally. you know, like in the beginning, you have these great introductions of who they are, different personalities, different talents. And now you get to see, you know, you see Chunk and his mom and she's like, you know, bringing pizza for him. And like, we're going to do this. Yeah. And that, that was and, his real mom. That's why he gives her yeah. a kiss. And like a bunch of me. Ah, thanks. Oh, it's, it's so good. And they were improv a lot. And that's when he was like, can he come home with us? Or we're going to or he's going to live with us now with Chunk and or with uh, Sloth and all that. But then. The greedy guy shows up. So now's the time that we got to do, like, you, you're going to, like, go track him down on the beach for this big meeting. And it's not like you're going to send, like, people under you. You're the guy that owns the company. It's not like you're going to send lawyers that work for you. No, no, you are going to come, and you're going to bring your bully son that was, you yeah. know, uh, heartbroken on, over. Let me show Green. you the ropes. <laughs> yeah, this let is me how show you how we do this. <laughs> yeah. And then, but, by the way, as a kid, totally bought. Hook, line, and sinker. I'm no on the problem. ride. My kids, who long say? I'm just saying, in retrospect, I'm like, where did these guys? Show? And wait, that's the guy's dad? I didn't know that that was his dad. And then uh, the, the, the maid, you know, happens to pull out the jewels that they got from the thing. So they didn't, they didn't take too much. They took just enough. And she is, you know, I don't know what she says over and over. And it's a beautiful moment. And they're like, the jewels and the dad has the contract. He's going to sign the contract on the beach. With, wouldn't he be like, just give me a moment. My kids were missing. Yeah. They're freezing. I don't know if they Can were I hurt. Think I don't, for a second? Yeah, like, I, I don't know if they have trauma. Just... Like, go fuck yourself. I'm dealing with my kids who might have been kidnapped by killers. The Fratellis, did you hear about them escaping today from <laughs> prison? And by the way, I think there was a lot of bacteria in that water slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they got attacked <laughs> by octopus? And you want me to sign this thing on this guy's back? Sign this thing? Wait, anyway. He has the guy they turns do back over. The they, octopus doesn't Chuck Chuck <laughs> mentions the octopus even though it's not in the movie. Like one of the kids mentions it. Yeah, that's funny. Like, I don't know. Like, oh, they had to fight off this doing. octopus. And, like they're trying to like rant about it, and, even though it's not in the movie. You're just kind of like, I, sure. So then he takes one look at the jewels. Well, I don't know if he's an expert jeweler or like if he <laughs> if he know like he, he, I don't even think he holds the jewels. He just knows they're real and he knows how much value they have because he's like, I am not signing this today or tomorrow <laughs> or ever again. And he throws everybody's like, ah, everybody's cheering. So <clears throat> everybody just accepts that. Oh, those are the jewels. By the way. <laughs> Whose jewels do they belong to? Like some of the kids, are like, wait, 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 that's my pouch. That comes to me. So sorry, guys. You're going to be on the other side of the the boondocks, right. you know. Um, you know <laughs> sorry. sorry. All right, maybe I'll loan you some money, but like those are my jewels. Um, and uh, you know, anyway, that that's that's it's that's so, that, like that's. I just, I, I just want a jewel expert to jump out of the crowd and go, I can hereby verify that these jewels are the exact amount of your house. <laughs> yeah, that's what, you, that's what you need. That's exactly what you need. And then we have the master stroke at the end, the, the, the master image of the uh, sailboat being set free and going off in the distance. And the parents have that last look of wonder that the kids have, and they realize that the the adventure that they went on and, and it, and it also gives you a feeling and a spirit of like, there's more adventures to continue. It's a good yeah. ending to the movie. It's so good. I mean, yeah, it's another moment that you could poke some holes in and go like the ship just <laughs> happens to sail away while they're on it. but it's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. And you know, wait a minute. So that the, the ship was stuck in that cave the whole time, but now it's, it's gone and it's fully operational and the sails are up. And anyway, yeah. Who's sailing um, this thing? Listen, I'm gonna. I miss Dick Donner. I mean, um, oh man, dude. And, he's just you know. love. I love everything he's done. Yeah, he's so good. Good job. Well, Dick I Donner. shouldn't say everything because. All right, 
we shouldn't watch the toy. Yeah, not the toy. Okay, uh, our top five is pirate movies, right, Joseph? Do you want to introduce top five for us? Yes, it is top pirate movies, and I, I think we can all agree the zero spot. Just to say, if there is a land pirate, it's Hans Gruber, and Die Hard goes in that spot. Oh, Die Hard's a total pirate movie. Hans I Gruber is a hundred percent pirate. <laughs> I, and yeah. and I I think like one of my favorites just growing up, Swiss Family Robinson. You know. Oh, Swiss Family Robinson's great. Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, I think is one of the greatest ever. I actually think that movie's perfect. Okay. Let's put let's put Pirates of the Caribbean up there. I think in terms of a pirate movie, uh and you know, that it is it it is a pirate movie doing all things pirate movie right. So it deserves to be there because it kind of yeah. takes all the old school pirate movies that we love from the past and perfects the story and perfects everything. But yeah. I am that I'm a fan of that one. I'm not as a big a fan of the other ones that come after that. Yes, agreed. The first one is, I think, perfect. I do not think the sequels it, it, are It's just close. like The Matrix. They made a good movie and they're like, hey, let's just create a world now. I completely agree with you. I totally agree. I, the first one is so superior, it's ridiculous, and the sequels feel like a reaction to the first movie. Now, so we got Goonies, Swiss Family Robinson, Shipwrecked, Muppet Treasure Island. Now, Cutthroat Island was a sleeper for me. Now, I haven't seen it. Yeah. I've only seen it once, and I went and saw it at the theater, and I really enjoyed it. Does it hold up? Have you seen it? Uh, I, it is a guilty pleasure. I'm, the, I'm in the same boat. I... I remember, no pun intended, I saw it in theater, and I loved it, and yeah, I, I have a soft spot for the movie. I haven't revisited it in a long time. It's one of the best pirate movie scores. Oh, Ice Pirates. <laughs> Were you an Ice Pirate guy growing up? I, I was not. I was oh, okay. not an Ice Pirate guy. Now, okay. you, you know Sloth, the actor Sloth, was yeah. in Ice Pirates as well. Yeah, he used to play for was the Raiders. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know um, that. So, well, if Let's if see. Ty if Ty was here, uh, Ice Pirates would be on. The, we would put that on the list. But we got Magnum PI. He's got different tastes. He got different priorities. So hey, it's not I, going I'm on down the list. Supported for you guys. No, uh, no, 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 no. That's this is the beauty of having so, like somebody here because it'll make the list a little different. I love Hook too. I love Hook. Hook's I pretty. really enjoy, another Spielbergian. Hook movie. is great. I think Princess yeah. Bride is a perfect movie I, I think the question is is it is it a pirate movie or not what do you think Wes? no no question princess bride is on this list and high up on the list and i do think it's a pirate movie i think it's a i Great. i mean you can I think put it should be it number can, two it, it, it could win two, yeah it could win other categories but it has like i mean it's certainly i mean it's the dread pirate roberts yeah. and it's what wesley yeah. came to be so it's and there's a lot of swashbuckling and sword and i was just uh, going to say it is pretty swashbuckling yeah i love and that and the treasure the treasure is is, is 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 the treasure is her true love mm -hmm. she's the treasure so that that's it's the thing love. that that's the thing they have to go mawed <laughs> mawed he's only mostly dead yeah, mostly did. I love that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, man. You know what? I haven't seen Waterworld in a long time, but I used to watch that all the time. But I don't know if I can consider it a swashbuckler either. But, man, I loved it. Yeah. It, it's not I was, good. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would say Waterworld mildly entertains me. I can't stand Black Kevin Coast. Costner. Captain Phil. All right. Wait, what Peter Pan is that? Because we kind of got Hook up there. Wh which one is, is that? The cartoon, or is that the new remake they did? There not was a, not the Hugh Jackman remake. There was one in the earlier two thousands. Um, but yeah, yeah the it, one with it uh, had, uh, Jason, Jason Isaacs, Isaacs and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was. Yeah, I really was enjoyed cool that one. one. Scroll it's down a, cool a little bit, Joseph. I, the last one I see is the Mark. Oh, portion. Oh. I did a movie <laughs> with the. Uh, I did a movie Temple with Jeremy Stumper. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> Poon Pirates. Uh, Poon you Pirates. Move uh, what, you Jeremy did a movie Sumter. with Poon Pirates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I <laughs> I did a movie with Jeremy Sumter, and so it's funny because every single female person on the set just was doting over Peter Pan. 
just wanted to talk to him about Peter Pan. It was so funny. Um, I remember Shipwrecked being cool. I don't. I don't. But, what's tell me? Explain that one. Now, to me. are we thinking of the sh- same shipwreck, Brett? The one with Gabriel Byrne? The, with, yeah, I'm thinking of the one with Gabriel Byrne. Yeah, it was like a Norwegian type film that got released here somehow. But it, it was, I, I yeah, always like, enjoyed it. Disney released it, and the yeah. third act of it, the third act of it, was like the pirate movie version of Home Alone. Where like he had all the traps on the island and the pirates are trying to get the treasure and they're all getting like hit by these makeshift jungle traps that the boy made. And I remember I went to a test screening of it that Disney hosted. I think Wes will have to uh, show the boys this if it's on Disney Plus. It's pretty good. Gabriel Shipwreck? Burns is a great villain. Yeah. What, what's yellow beard? Yellow beard sounds familiar, and I don't. It's a comedy. Uh, it was from one of the Monty Python guys. It had yeah. Cheech and Chong in it. Yeah, it it was a, a a horrible '80s comedy. Now, The Martian is that the Matt Damon? I, I'm just joking because oh. at the end, when he he claimed the ship, he was like basically saying that he was a pirate, a space pirate. Uh huh. Right. What was Black Sails? Oh, you've never seen the Black Sails TV show? Oh. It was a great show. No, um, I didn't see it. Really good cast. I forget the uh, the lead actor you would recognize him uh toby stevens okay yeah i think i i remember hearing about that but i don't i didn't see that uh okay what do we got we got die hard pirates of the caribbean the princess bride uh i mean hook is the only other thing on this list that i'm enthusiastic about so i think hook would go on the list um yeah hook and for the sure. only other I, I didn't i haven't seen in any of the other ones well we always have goonies I mean, true, but yeah, pirates. I mean, it's a critical component of it. But is there a lot of swashbuckling? Oh, I would put Goonies in a pirate movie for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think Goonies counts. So we're at one, two, three, four, five. Uh, please like, subscribe, and ring that little bell every time you ring that bell. Ty Frank gets its wings. Um, thank Magnum Pi for joining us in his. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been uh you know, it's 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 been many many years since his show, you know, he's getting up there in years, so like, you know, the, the energy level that he has, but to be able to come and join us, I really appreciate it. And next time could you wear your Hawaiian shirt, please? Uh I will. but yeah, uh, uh did you have a good time, Brett? I sure did. That was awesome. Yeah. I love talking movies with you, especially movies like this. Yeah. I apologize ahead of time about you being swarmed at malls and, and public events because uh, this, uh, this, this uh, podcast has a massive following. Um, and, uh, but they're going to help us do our tie in that guy horror film. So we appreciate them. I appreciate that. Let's go. Let's make the movie. <laughs> Let's do it. Thank you guys for hanging out. Say goodbye, Brett. See you, everybody. Never say die. <laughs>